In the mid-90s, uh, a bunch of artists turned to film, like Robert Longo, Johnny Mnemonic, David Saleh, Search and Destroy, Cindy Sherman. They never went back. They're all around the same time of, as yours. Was there something in the air at the same time as you, you did Basquiat in 1996 or maybe? It came out in 96. I made yeah. it in 95. Right, yeah. right. You, should, you all, were, was there something in the air that everyone was... They were, they were fiction, but you, you went for fact. Uh, I didn't really pay too much attention to what other people were doing. They were doing. Uh, David uh, uh, is, you know, somebody I know pretty well, mm -hmm. and uh, he actually wrote something very beautiful about the I, diving bell and the butterfly. I read, I read it in the, the, the book. One of the one of the best things that anybody wrote about the movie, and uh, uh, but. I didn't do it as part of a group or part of a trend. I just made the movie because Jean-Michel died. A guy came to interview me about him, and there weren't a lot of directors coming over to my studio and asking me what I thought about anything. Well, now you're a talking head, because everyone, you, like, you're like the last man standing. Basquiat's dead, Warhol's dead. If they want to know things, of, they would come to you, because you're... Well, you're not dead. You're not dead, right, right, you're not dead. <laughs> You moved from painting to film, at least outwardly, with relative ease. And you're quoted, you were quoted as, as saying, and I think I even heard you in an interview say, you thought you were too old to be a director. And yet, you're remarkable. No obvious training in, in cin 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 cinematic technique, casting, directing actors, and, and yet, a, 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 as you said, Dennis Hopper walked in while you were there and said, you look like you've been doing this for 40 years. How, I know you, we all learn on the fly, where you just, well, hey, it's not rocket science, I'm going to do it. Is, was that how, how you approached? Yeah. That, that, sort of. That I mean, uh, I mean it's, obviously, I knew my subject. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that has a big... Uh, I think a lot of directors don't know their subject. They know a craft and they know how to illustrate a script. Mm -hmm. But essentially, I, I wasn't trying to make anything up. I mean, I'd been in the basement with Jean-Michel. I'd mm -hmm. witnessed uh, different kinds of injustice or different kinds of right. uh, situations. Uh, I lived through it. He didn't. I mm -hmm. felt like I had a... I, usually, if I, if I make a movie, I think that there's something that... Mm -hmm. There's some reason why I will do it, not... If I think somebody else could do it, I won't do it. Yeah. Uh, Jaris Kaminsky, your cinematographer? Janusz Kaminsky. Janusz? Janusz. My pronunciation is all... Well, probably look, you thought the N was an R. No, no, I barely speak English. So. Um, Me too. <laughs> no, you have a pretty good vocabulary, I have heard you. It, he said, unlike many directors, you do not like to rehearse scenes from the same, same angle. You said directing is like you th throw them in a pit, and if they climb out, we can go home. Uh, because you were not restrained by formal language, you're able to discover, I mean, what I want to Formal know, training, you formal, mean? Formal, formal, yeah, formal training, formal training. Right. You do things... Your cinematographer said that ordinarily aren't done, and you, and you make them work. What I'd like to talk a little bit or hear a little bit about you, sir, is in the Diving Bell. It was the most fabulous movie. I mean, I was Booby. He was me. I mean, I felt time. I felt consciousness. I I read somewhere you you sewed something over the lens. You know, you did all kinds of things to make to to magic, which this to me is your most painterly so far film, mm -hmm. most painterly. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, well, when somebody is paralyzed, mm -hmm. uh, and they, you know, they can't move their head, you know that they can't move that sets up some opportunities for somebody that's making a movie about that character because uh, the audience believes that they can't move also. So mm -hmm. for example, if they can't pick their head up, that means you can cut somebody's head off in, in the middle and somebody's not gonna think that you can't control the camera. They'll think, oh, well, he can't pick his head up. 
the characters were seeing what he's seeing, mm -hmm. so the heads are cut off of these char characters. Now, when I watch movies, most of the time I look at them, no matter what the story is, they're told in a relatively um, ordinary way that I've seen a million times. And so um, no matter what is the subtext or the story, you're looking at the movie and you're thinking, you, you, for me, it's very hard to separate content from form. So um, in this case, I had many opportunities because this man said, uh, the only thing that's not paralyzed besides my mm -hmm. eye is my imagination. And I had written a script about, uh, about uh, Jean-Baptiste Grenouille, the per who was the uh, protagonist in the book Perfume. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to make that movie. I mean, it was a real... I read that book. It was really a detailed, very interesting book. I wrote a really good script to it also. Mm -hmm. And uh, I almost made the film. The, the man who owned the rights and I didn't see eye to eye. I don't know if you've seen the film that was made. It was terrible. No, I didn't. I, yeah, well, you didn't miss anything. It didn't look good. Uh, because the notion wasn't to make the guy more like you or me, but to make him different the way he was. And we'd have to reorganize our chromosomes, our moral chromosomes, so we could, when that orgy is happening, instead of thinking, oh, I'm shocked by this, we're thinking, hey, I want to sit through this and watch because I want to see if that perfume works. Mm -hmm. And so I had written a script and I thought that this man could smell all the way to Alaska mm -hmm. or Egypt. Mm -hmm. So in the script that I wrote, it starts with him climbing up this mountain mm -hmm. and then he eats a salamander while he's climbing up this uh, out of the rocky crag or something and then uh, you think, well, maybe that's a little weird that he did that. And then he jumps up in the air and throws his arms in the air, and he's then he crawls into this hole. Mm -hmm. And then the camera pushes into his head, and you start to see inside of his head like he's dreaming or wherever he is. I mean, you, you start to go in, or like you just, a story's going to be told to you. And as we push in, we see him sitting in some fancy clothes in the purple salon, and He's, as he takes a drink from one of these glasses, it has a date on it, it takes you back to this place, 17 whatever, Paris. And so you think that the narrator is this man who is drinking these things. And you, probably, and you think if you never read the book, well, he must have been a rich guy at one time, and then he must have had some trouble, and he's telling us his story now. That's viable, reasonable, uh, interpretation of what you're seeing. And then you watch the movie and about page 66 he climbs back into that, gets up to that, that, that hill again and he goes in to the cave and the narrator starts to say and he slept for seven years and he would have stayed there probably the rest of his life except the fabric of his dream started to fall apart. And he realized that his scent was a scent of fog, and that terrified him. And as you're seeing that, you see the guy who's the narrator starting to crawl up on top of the couch in this library with all of the bottles there, and everything is turning into first mist, and then the room is starting to disappear, and so is he starting to disappear. And you realize that the narrator was a dream at that point. Mm -hmm. And the guy screams, you just hear a scream and you see this hole and you see the landscape. And the next thing you see is just the point of view that's running down a hill until finally this guy arrives at somewhere where people that are villagers start running away from him. And the next thing you see is uh, a sack go over the head of the camera and a clunk and you hear somebody say, he has journeyman's papers. And the next thing you see is Christopher Walken standing in front of him as he say, okay, Let's see, let's look at them. And they take the, so it's as if they took the, uh, the, the sackcloth off his head. And you see a guy there with a long beard, talons for fingernails, and then your story begins. And so what you wouldn't know is that the narrator was a dream. And, um, and in the process of doing that, I had written this scene where you see Egypt, you see Alaska. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, I can't make a movie about 
Jean Doe, uh, Jean Baptiste Grenouille, but I can make one about Jean Doe. And if, if this guy could travel that to that place with his olfactory sense, mm -hmm. this other guy can go there with his imagination. So I added those things to the script, and for of me, the, of the diving bell. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So for me, you know, that was the key. Once I found those icebergs, those those uh, those uh, avalanches going into the the ice shelf falling apart. That was it, and I had this Bach music that I was playing mm -hmm. with it, and what happened was it was on a, a VHS, and when it got to the end, it rewound, it, re it rewound automatically. So I started seeing the, the fragments of these, of these uh, icebergs starting to go back in their place, <laughs> and that was it, you know, I thought, fuck, I understand. Mm -hmm what I have to do here, and that was a key for me to make the diving bell and the butterfly. 